Live from Seattle, Washington, it's theCUBE, covering KubeCon and CloudNativeCon North America 2018. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and its ecosystem partners. Hello everyone, welcome back to theCUBE's the live coverage. Day three on. here, okay. theCUBE covering KubeCon and CloudNativeCon 2018 in Seattle. I'm John Furrier at Stu Miniman and Justin Warren here to break down the action. Justin Warren, as you know, is a guest analyst for us at many events, chief analyst at Pivot9, uh, coming all the back over here again to break it down. So Better we're going to dissect what's going on here at KubeCon, CloudNativeCon. This is, some say, me, Better the last Jerry. stand to stop you Amazon. <laughs> Justin, good to see you. Make good to see you as well, Let's do. All right, first question is, um, as the show winds down day three, a lot of people had left all the big execs are gone, this is kind of last day, people come coming together, the party was last night, so we kind of see all the action, we kind of fished this pond dry in the cube here, um, last couple days, the themes are starting to emerge. Yeah. What are you seeing, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I, I mean, first of all, John, 8,000 people, this is, you know, geeks that are really excited, and, and I, I mean that, that in the best of ways, of course. Uh, there's actually, there were people here before the show started doing here. lightning talks and full day sessions. Maybe Tomorrow maybe there's an operator the session that another maybe 250 or 300 people will be doing Friday, so, you know, and people want to just, you know, suck the marrow out of the, you know, <laughs> the bone that is everything going on here. Just get every ounce of knowledge here, the and they are wrong. deep into the session, so this is a great community. Um, the question I want to ask you guys is, you were at How Amazon reInvent two weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've watched that show. I want the compare and contrast of this ecosystem and show, not just compared to like say, OpenStack, which we've been teasing apart all week, and I think there are some things we need to worry about, but a lot of good differences, but compare against the big one in the room, which is Amazon, and a big difference is Amazon is here, and they have a seat at the table, because yeah. they, they have to, and customers will force them there, but you know, should this worry Amazon? And how does this ecosystem compare with the Amazon ecosystem? The big thing for me is, I understand how people make money in the, eco in the ecosystem of Amazon. I'm still trying to figure that out here. Yeah. Uh, it is a different ecosystem. It does have a bit of a vibe of it could be the new reInvent. I mean, we've had conversations over the last couple of days or, about- Or, or is, this, is this the independent cloud, exactly. you know, open yeah. ecosystem? And it's, it is the independent show that we've been waiting for, that we've wanted since you know, Comdex and Interop kind of went away and it's all been vendor shows and now we have an independent show where all the vendors can come and have kind of a neutral meeting place and we can all gather together and, and have some common ground, which is like, that's what Kubernetes is. I, I've been saying over the last couple of days, Kubernetes is like the ethernet of cloud. So it's something which is an agreed standard we can all collaborate on and then you, know, you never bet against it, ethernet. So oh. now you can build all of these other things on top of that platform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a quick note on that, right, this interop, when like networking was at the core of that, yeah. it was basically everybody, oh, yeah, it's, it's the chance if we give true interoperability, maybe we can yeah. do multi-vendor and it won't all be Cisco who yeah. dominated that market. Amazon's the same. Stu, yeah. this is to me, Ethernet's a great example. I say TCP IP as well. Yeah. Both are enabling technologies that are standardized or actually started as de facto standards. They weren't necessarily you know, bona fide standards. They emerged yeah. and people rallied around them. Those de facto standards emerge and become a catalyst point for people to build yeah. on top of and around. Remember, it was still a lower level below the stack on Ethernet, so you had you know, physical data link layer in the, in the OSI model, the, the, the grandfather of all stacks. That really changed, I think, 20 years of growth and, and innovation. Yep. I think Kubernetes is exactly right, Justin. This is exactly your point. I see that as well, that it's not so much Kubernetes is going to be the be all end all, it's what it enables. And I yep. think the innovations on top of, of Kubernetes and underneath Kubernetes take the holy trinity, I've been saying this in theCUBE now for the past year, the holy trinity of infrastructure and IT is storage, compute, and networking. Yeah. And those things are now being repurposed in a way that is um, highly scalable, dynamic, and, and, and resourceful yeah. for, um, for a lot of things. AI is a great example, everyone talks about AI, but storage, policy, the knobs in Kubernetes can be can managed, and you know, Google saying the guys of Kubernetes, that's one of the most underutilized aspects of Kubernetes is the networking guys managing the knobs from below, yeah. and then the app guys with service meshes maybe on the top. This is just an absolute growth engine, and the comparison to Amazon is similar because Andy Jassy talks about builders, the right tool for the job. This is essentially the same mantra. 
I mean, this is tools, It's platforms. very similar, but with one very important difference and around the money side of things. You don't have this massive behemoth which is going to come in and you know, one year you're on the keynote and the next year we just announced a product which completely killed your business. It's open source, that's not really going to happen. So you've got that common core of things where there's no real com competitive advantage on this stuff. So that's, you know, Linux, where's the competitive advantage on, on a kernel? There isn't one. So open source makes great sense yeah. for that kind of core of things that you then build upon, and then all the money is in all the innovation, all the value yeah. add that goes on top of that. And that makes a huge amount of sense to have an open source show and for that. And I think, Stu, one of the things that we always kind of talk about, networking and cloud, I think the concept of cloud is going to be old hat. You heard it here first on theCUBE, because Cloud is Amazon, and cloud is a set of resources. When you start thinking about IoT at the edge, when you talk about moving compute to the edge, you're going to start to see you know, mesh networks, peer-to-peer, -peer, new kind of platform configurations that not, isn't necessarily cloud, it's a new thing. It's a platform, open platform, and there's going to be some incentives that are going to be designed for startups mm. that's economically beneficial to the new kinds of things, versus the economic incentives that might, Amazon might not have yeah. to do things. So I think we're going to see emergence of new stuff. I would still say that cloud is a state of mind, it's not a location. Yeah. So it's, and we're here, it's cloud native con. It's not just KubeCon, it's about doing things in a cloud native way. And that, like you say, it doesn't matter where it is or how it communicates together, but it's the way you operate it. It's the way it actually works in practice. It's not so much about, oh, we're going to build it here and we're going to put it in that cloud or that cloud right. or that cloud. And I think you know, we've had some real clarity as to what that future of multi-cloud looks like. Because yep. it's not one massive cloud everywhere. It's not, oh, my application spanning all over the place. Yep. Uh, it, it is we are working to solve that really tough problem of distributed architectures and giving us ways that I shouldn't have to think about you know, where I am spinning that up or if I yeah, need yeah. to change vendor. Not necessarily portability, you still do have yeah. some lock-in because Kubernetes is not the full stack, it's a piece yeah. of the overall platform and while, while there's like 75 different versions here that are all compliant, I should be able to move between them, but the devil's in the details well, and there's lots of stuff that's on top. Let's talk about multi-cloud, I want to talk about yeah. multi-cloud for a second because you mentioned Comdex, you talked about Ethernet. At that time, during these big, those big revolutions, the word multi-vendor was a big buzzword. Yeah. Multi-vendor was like the basis of Comdex. We all got to play together. Multi-vendor meant, meant choice. Today, multi-cloud is just a modern version of multi-vendor. It's, exactly, it's multi-vendor. Like and that's what enterprises want. Enterprises are a bit wary now. We, we, we hear lots of conversation about lock-in. And, and that comes up a lot, and it's a real thing. The enterprises are concerned that they, they don't want to bet on one company and then find out that actually it's technology. It changes, things need to be moved around. We don't want to wake up in five, six years and suddenly find, oh my God, I can't change anything because I'm locked into this one vendor. So, so, so Justin, they say they want multi-vendor. Yeah. When it came to networking, I, you know, I spent years working on interoperability and plug tests and all these things, and at the end of the day, it was way better to get my standards plus with a single vendor than it was to try to root them together, and yeah. then, oh, when I change something, so hopefully the difference here is actually we have loosely coupled services, we have APIs, so can we actually do multi-vendor, you know, multi-cloud that doesn't, you know, stress out my team and have every time I want to make a change or they make a change, it moves. The, the new cloud world should be, things change, you know, it, it changes upstream and downstream yeah. I get to use them. So, you know, once, once again, we, we talk about the shiny nirvana of, oh, you know, it's serverless and the, the old trinity of, you know, compute and storage. I don't even need to worry about that because it'll just work. Uh, but wait, if something yeah. goes wrong, I, I've been talking to a bunch of vendors here that actually how do I get observability and manageability to be able to drill down because uh, things could still go wrong. Well, you yeah. heard Bloomberg, we had an end user come on. It's yeah. a very interesting point. And uh, Dan Kahn from the executive director, well, Bloomberg's kind of a different case, but look at what Bloomberg does. The guy said to us, I actually don't want to buy these products and services. I just want to pay them money to be available to support me when I need support, because Bloomberg has fully integrated all their support internally. Yeah. I think that's a trend that we're going to see in the enterprise where Good morning, CIOs attendees. start building we teams, real software chops. It might not be as big as Bloomberg, travel. but the notion we of we're going to run our own stuff. Yeah. We'll use managed services where appropriate, but we're going to have a core software build strategy, and I, got, I can't wait. You yeah, know, an SLA of four hour response yeah. time. I need yeah. like minutes. And that's how I think where the, we don't have the answers yet. There's still a lot of questions that enterprises are trying to work out about how do I actually do that? So you mentioned Google, uh, Bloomberg, and I, I interviewed them a few months ago, wrote something in Forbes about them. 
Uh, they are a special Mark case in that they have chosen that we're going He's to invest in this technology so that we have Mark people Hahn on staff in our company who understand Kubernetes. Now that's not a choice that every enterprise is going to make, but they decided that actually this technology, this software is so important to our business, to where we get all the value for our business, that we need to invest in that yeah. technology. And I think a lot of enterprises are realizing that actually outsourcing everything to one vendor and then giving all of your innovation engine to someone else, and they're realizing that was a mistake. Now they're trying to figure out, okay, what do we bring in house, what do we do ourselves, what do we get vendors to do, which technologies do we use for what particular value creation, and that complexity, that decision making process, that's what we haven't quite worked out yet. Yeah. And that's where I think there's a lot of value in the ecosystem with service providers who can provide advice on here is how you should do it based on what you need to do. That's a great point, Stu. I want you to comment on, on that. Let's riff on this for a second because the people actually spend the money are the, the people reimagining IT infrastructure, IT applications. The CIO, I've interviewed the VP of um, Advanced Technology at Procter & Gamble, and he told me when he came in, he came from Coca-Cola, he's been an old IT guy, he says, look, we've outsourced everything to the point where we're, we're anemic. We got a couple storage guys, they're pushing buttons, they're jumping on, all the vendors, they outsource everything. He says we, they had no ability to create a competitive advantage for the business. Yeah. And what they real moved quickly to is to bring talent in to be builders, to be in-house. Yeah. So now you have that trend happening in the modern CIO, CXO kind of roles. Now you have to say, okay, I got teams here. How do I get the investments deployed? How do I go to this ecosystem here with all these tools, oh, yeah. all these capabilities? How do I invest? How do I build out? No, look, I think Kelsey Tire, Hightower had a great point when we interviewed him uh, th this week. It is a huge opportunity for managed services because uh, like we talk about the Amazon or even ecosystem, you know, how do I keep up with all of this? And the answer is, yeah. you don't. You need to be able to have people, whether it's you know, systems integrators or partners that are going to be to help that. You know, look, Amazon gets criticized for not being deeper in open source. Well, they use a lot of open source and they deliver those as services and they make it easy. Frictionless is something we talked about for, for many years as being in the thing. The enterprise wants to be able to spend money and just go do it because they don't have the team of PhDs. Even somebody like you know, Bloomberg or you know, some of these really big companies, I love you know, talking, you've got Apple and Nordstrom and you know, some really here interesting. At the show. Oh, by the way, and they're all hiring. Yeah. Uh, whether or not they're actually using Kubernetes, they cannot confirm or deny, but you know, we, we, well, we know how that's going. Hold on, goes. first of all, let's, let's but, unpack the end user yeah. piece here, okay? Amazon is pushing 5,000 referenceable customers. Yeah. Okay, so about the Amazon question. We end users here. How many referential customers are here? What are they actually? Uber's here. They're hiring. Are, you know, they got, might have some Kubernetes stuff in the background. Sure, they probably do. But actually, what does the end user adoption really look like? Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's still early, but uh, again, a, a difference between this show and Amazon reInvent. How many end customers have a booth at reInvent? compared to here where we have people, end customers who are here mostly to try to and, hire and, talent, and, and they have booths. Kudos to the CNCF, they've got 80 end users participating, there are a lot of users here. This is not the vendor fest uh, that we see at some shows when they get big, I hear they're not soaking the vendors. The vendors that I talk to are happy because there are the users here and they're excited. Yeah. Before we go John, there's a couple of kinks in the armors and things we need to worry about. And the, the, the two, you know, if I look at service meshes and I look at serverless yeah. um, as a huge threat. One of the things I wanted to look at coming in was, I'd heard a lot of talk about Knative, and I think Knative is great, but it is not, you know, Lambda is, you know, the de facto standard, just like, you know, S3 was uh, before, Lambda is this, and Knative has absolutely nothing to do with Lambda and does not connect with it. Yeah. It is the difference between serverless and functions, and so all the AWS functions and all the Azure functions have nothing to do with Knative. For the people that looked at OpenWhisk and all these other options, Knative seems a good way to pull. They've done a respin of what's happening there, and it's moving things down the line. Once again, as Kelsey said, if we look at serverless as a spectrum, which many of the hardcore serverless people will debate and argue and be like, that's not real yeah. uh, serverless. Well, just like we said, you know, there was only one real cloud and it was Amazon. We know that's not the case. It will be a spectrum. You want to meet customers where they are. So yeah. Knative, goodness, but it, it, the elephant in the room is that AWS and Azure are where all of the serverless really happens. And therefore, you know, th there's a big air gap between them. 
Justin, service mesh is something I know you've been, been looking at, and yeah. it gives the good, the bad, and the ugly. Service mesh is really, really early. So we're, we're at that part where there's a diversity of, of innovation going on. So we just, where there's about 12 or at least 12 different companies here at the show who are all doing something with service mesh. They're all trying to sell you a different solution. This is what happens with technology. We, we have a new technology gets created and we have this flurry of all these startups who are all trying these different things. And they said, this is the, you know, the, the, what is it, the destructive force of capitalism. It's like, not all of them are going to succeed but we have to have them all out in there in the market because at the moment it's too early to figure out, okay, well it's definitely going to be that one. If we knew that one, then I'd be putting all of my money behind that one company today. Yeah. Last year, Justin, all the talk was about Istio. Yeah. I've heard a lot of talk about Istio, but it hasn't all been good. No, that's the thing. So we've had a year now, and last year was definitely, hey, Istio is like the service mesh. Like, not so much. Envoy seems to be the common ground that people are actively using. That's what most people are building on top of. So it looks like Envoy is going to be that, that underlay of everything else. But in terms of how you actually use service mesh, it's still very early, and people are trying to figure out, how do I use this quite complex technology in practice? And as people use it more, as we get more adoption, then we'll start to see that one, one or two of the, the methods and the approaches will win out over all of the others. And that's where we can expect to see, okay, we'll have an anointed winner, that will then win out because it's useful, because it's functional, because end users want to do it that way. And Envoy, by the way, had traction. They had it sold out, Envoy Con, on yeah. the first day, 350 people. Lyft is driving that, and they're just heads down solving problems. And I think that yeah. seems to be the formula for some of the successful products, if you take away all the, the window dressing and yep. the hype, it comes down to who's solving what problem. And that's the thing with open source, you can't just throw a whole bunch of marketing dollars at it to make it succeed. If end users don't like the code and they don't use it, then it won't work. Yeah, John, I, I want you to give us the, 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 the word on the open source business model. We watched in the last year, you know, Red Hat bought CoreOS for 250 million, then they were acquired by IBM for 34 billion, you know, pending final, all that stuff and everything. And then, you know, reading through the VMware SEC filing, $550 million for Heptio. Yep. Um, you know, yeah. big, big dollars. So, you know, is, is, the, is open source just to get a lot of customers and they get acquired by the gig, big guys? What's the uh, Well, I, I think it's take? interesting. First of all, um, Red Hat might not like what I'm about to say, but I'll just say it. Um, I think there was a steal with CoreOS. If you look at what Heptio got for the valuation, um, CoreOS was an absolute steal. The team was phenomenal. Um, they were doing some amazing work. At that time of the acquisition, the debate of how to make money dominated versus just getting behind the technology, and I think CoreOS was a fantastic team, and they had the right track, and you can see what's happening now, now part of the Red Hat. So Red Hat got a massive lift on that. So I think, you know, kudos to Red Hat for, for taking that off the table at the time. Great acquisition, I think that helped them propel, and that showed that to IBM that there's real value there. Now I think open source as a business model is interesting because it's changing, right? You now have a new generation of builders and, and developers coming in, Open source has to evolve, and I think the CNCF, I think, is a cutting edge uh, experiment or a petri dish of how to stay true to open source principles yeah. and still nurture and enable a downstream impact for the commercialization. I think it's an opportunity, but it's also one of their biggest challenges because if this is Comdex, if Comdex isn't open source, it's yeah. hawking hawk wares, right? Yeah. So, like, you're, so it's a different business model. So this is going to be a very interesting test in the industry to see how the current open source momentum, which is looking really strong right now, how that can inter interplay with commercialization. Yeah. Because certainly the money's there, the value's there, and if we can get these value spots identified, the white spaces for startups, and let the big guys also play as well, it's going to be a very interesting landscape. It's certainly dynamic. I don't have the answers, but my gut's telling me that a whole new level of sets of services and platforms are going to be composed mm. around these services, and I think it's all going to be driven by open source. Uh, that's clear. How it shakes out, valuation, is it a talent buy, is it momentum, market buy? Yeah, we'll be watching, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's exciting times. We're, we're, just, we're here at the beginnings of what I hope is going to be this massive new ecosystem, and we get to watch it grow, we get to watch it change. It's, yeah. it's a great place to be. All I can say, Stu, is I wish I was 25 years old <laughs> again, right now, because it, for young entrepreneurs and young tech folks, this is probably one of the most exciting times because you have real computer science and, and dormant 
you know, it's computer science now re-energized with cloud computing yeah, but scale. John, they, they, they don't appreciate like, what they had, you know? They don't know what it was like <laughs> to, you know, have a computer that wasn't actually connected to things, uh, you know, let, let alone what we had. I used to build my own graphics libraries. I used to walk to school in bare feet in the snow. It was so <laughs> hard. It's we so to, easy now. Yeah, creating ones and zeros for my by token by ring. It's, uh, you creating know, ones and zeros by banging rocks so together, yeah. So easy now. You guys got it made. You have no idea. Great stuff, Stu. This is uh, great analysis, and I think, again, KubeCon is the beginning with cloud native. Yeah. Just, this is just a, a small signal, I think. I think there's going to be a Comdex moment soon, uh, unless this thing just blows up, which I don't think is going to happen. Yeah, I, I mean, look, last thing, John, you know, I want a big thank to the Linux Foundation, CNCF, uh, for, for working with us. We've been there within the early days. Uh, great partnership, this community. Yeah. They've got a great media section. Uh, you know, all our friends over here that are creating a lot of content, working really hard. The yeah. amount of work that goes through, and yeah. as we had the people from the CNCF talking, you know, they've got a core team, but it's people that volunteer, and we're community too, and all our sponsors, yeah. John. Yeah, thanks to yeah. the community. And again, one more final point is that this market, Justin, as you know, you, we all cover it, is in a learning mode. There's a lot of education-oriented stuff that people are interested in. Yep. You got you know, uh, Alex Williams over at Newstack, DevOps.com, TFIR over there, everyone's pumping media out there. There is a thirst for content, there's a thirst for uh, community learning, the sessions are packed. I mean, the hallways are interesting. You see people huddling, and I overhear the conversations. They're not talking about what party to go to, they're talking about how to implement a Kubernetes cluster. So there's yep. really people working on and off the court here, so to speak. So it's been great, great coverage. So day three, breaking it down. I'm Jeff Furrier, Justin Warren, Stu Miniman, back with more coverage. Day three after this short break. <laughs>